Chapter Twelve of Book One of Les Misérables, Volume Two by Victor Hugo. Les Misérables, Volume Two by Victor Hugo, translated by Isabel Florence Hapgood. Book First, Waterloo, Chapter Twelve, The Guard. Every one knows the rest: the eruption of a third army, the battle broken to pieces. Eighty-six mouths of fire thundering simultaneously. Pirch the first coming up with Bülow, Tieten's cavalry led by Blücher in person, the French driven back. Marconnie swept from the plateau of Ouin, Durut dislodged from Papelotte, Danzelot and Kio retreating, Lobo caught on the flank. A fresh battle precipitating itself on our dismantled regiments at nightfall. The whole English line resuming the offensive and thrust forward, the gigantic breach made in the French army, the English grape shot and the Prussian grape shot aiding each other, the extermination, disaster in front, disaster on the flank, the guard entering the line in the midst of this terrible crumbling of all things. Conscious that they were about to die, they shouted, "Vive l'empereur!" History records nothing more touching than that agony bursting forth in acclamations. The sky had been overcast all day long. All of a sudden, at that very moment, it was eight o'clock in the evening. The clouds on the horizon parted. And allowed the grand and sinister glow of the setting sun to pass through, athwart the elms on the Nivelle Road. They had seen it rise at Austerlitz. Each battalion of the guard was commanded by a general for this final catastrophe. Friant, Michel, Roguet, Arlet, Mallet, Poré de Morvan were there. When the tall caps of the grenadiers of the guard. With their large plaques bearing the eagle, appeared symmetrical in line, tranquil in the midst of that combat. The enemy felt a respect for France. They thought they beheld twenty victories entering the field of battle with wings outspread, and those who were the conquerors, believing themselves to be vanquished, retreated. But Wellington shouted, "Up, guards, and aim straight!" The red regiment of English guards, lying flat behind the hedges, sprang up. A cloud of grape shot riddled the tricoloured flag and whistled round our eagles. All hurled themselves forwards, and the final carnage began. In the darkness, the Imperial Guard felt the army losing ground around it, and in the vast shock of the rout, it heard the desperate flight which had taken the place of the Vive l'Empereur. And with flight behind it, it continued to advance, more crushed, losing more men at every step that it took. There were none who hesitated, no timid men in its ranks. The soldier in that troop was as much of a hero as the general. Not a man was missing in that suicide. Nay, bewildered. Great with all the grandeur of accepted death, offered himself to all blows in that tempest. He had his fifth horse killed under him there. Perspiring, his eyes aflame, foaming at the mouth, with uniform unbuttoned, one of his epaulets half cut off by a sword stroke from a horse guard, his plaque with the great eagle dented by a bullet, bleeding, bemired, magnificent. A broken sword in his hand, he said, "Come and see how a marshal of France dies on the field of battle." But in vain, he did not die. He was haggard and angry. At Drouet d'Erlon, he hurled this question: "Are you not going to get yourself killed?" In the midst of all that artillery engaged in crushing a handful of men, he shouted. So there is nothing for me. Oh, I should like to have all these English bullets enter my bowels. Unhappy man, 
thou wert reserved for French bullets. End of Book First, Chapter Twelve Chapter Thirteen of Book One of Les Miserables, Volume Two by Victor Hugo Les Miserables, Volume Two by Victor Hugo Translated by Isabel Florence Hapgood Book First, Waterloo, Chapter Thirteen The Catastrophe The route behind the guard was melancholy. The army yielded suddenly on all sides at once. Hugomont, La Haisson, Papelot, Plancenoit. The cry, Treachery, was followed by a cry of, Save yourselves who can! An army which is disbanding is like a thaw. All yields, splits, cracks, floats, rolls, falls, jostles, hastens, is precipitated. The disintegration is unprecedented. Ney borrows a horse, leaps upon it, and, without a hat, cravat, or sword, places himself across the Brussels road, stopping both English and French. He strives to detain the army, he recalls it to its duty, he insults it, he clings to the rout. He is overwhelmed. The soldiers fly from him, shouting, Long live Marshal Ney! Two of de Root's regiments go and come in a fright, as though tossed back and forth between the swords of the Uhlans and the fusillade of the brigades of Kempt, Best, Pack, and Relant. The worst of hand-to-hand -hand conflicts is the defeat. Friends kill each other in order to escape. Squadrons and battalions break and disperse against each other, like the tremendous foam of battle. Lebeau at one extremity, and Ryle at the other, are drawn into the tide. In vain does Napoleon erect walls from what is left to him of his guard. In vain does he expend in a last effort his last serviceable squadrons. Keogh retreats before Vivian, Kellerman before Vandeleur, Lubeau before Bulow, Morand before Perch, Damon and Subervik before Prince William of Prussia. Guyot, who led the Emperor's squadrons to the charge, falls beneath the feet of the English dragoons. Napoleon gallops past the line of fugitives, harangues, urges, threatens, entreats them. All the mouths which in the morning had shouted, Long live the Emperor! remain gaping. They hardly recognize him. The Prussian cavalry, newly arrived, dashes forward, flies, hews, slashes, kills, exterminates. Horses lash out, the cannons flee, the soldiers of the artillery train unharness the caissons and use the horses to make their escape. Transports overturned, with all four wheels in the air, clog the road and occasion massacres. Men are crushed, trample down, Others walk over the dead and the living. Arms are lost. A dizzy multitude fills the roads, the paths, the bridges, the plains, the hills, the valleys, the woods. Encumbered by this invasion of forty thousand men. Shouts of despair, knapsacks and guns flung among the rye. Passages forced at the point of the sword. No more comrades, no more officers, no more generals. An inexpressible terror. Zeiten putting France to the sword at its leisure, lions converted into goats. Such was the flight. At Genappe, an effort was made to wheel about, to present a battle front, to draw up a line. Lebeau rallied three hundred men. The entrance to the village was barricaded, but at the first volley of Prussian canister, all took to flight again, and Lebeau was taken. That volley of grape shot can be seen today imprinted on the ancient gable of a brick building on the right of the road a few minutes distance before you enter Genappe. The Prussians threw themselves into Genappe, furious, no doubt, that they were not more entirely the conquerors. The pursuit was stupendous. Blücher ordered extermination. Roguet had set the lugubrious example of threatening with death any French grenadier who should bring him a Prussian prisoner. Blücher outdid Roguet. Duhaime, the general of the young guard, hemmed in at the doorway of an inn at Genappe, surrendered his sword to a hussar of death, who took the sword and slew the prisoner. The victory was completed by the assassination of the vanquished. Let us inflict punishment since we are history. Old Blücher disgraced himself. This ferocity put the finishing touch to the disaster. The desperate route traversed Genappe, traversed Cotterbras, traversed Gosselies, traversed Frayne, traversed Charleroi, traversed Thien, and only halted at the frontier. 
Alas, and who then was fleeing in that manner? The Grand Army. This vertigo, this terror, this downfall into ruin of the loftiest bravery which ever astounded history, is that causeless? No. The shadow of an enormous right is projected athwart Waterloo. It is the day of destiny, the force which is mightier than man produced that day. Hence the terrified wrinkle of those brows, hence all those great souls surrendering their swords. Those who had conquered Europe have fallen prone on the earth, with nothing left to say nor to do, feeling the present shadow of a terrible presence. Hoc erat in fatis. That day the perspective of the human race underwent a change. Waterloo is the hinge of the nineteenth century. The disappearance of the great man was necessary to the advent of the great century. Someone, a person to whom one replies not, took the responsibility on himself. The panic of heroes can be explained. In the Battle of Waterloo there is something more than a cloud. There is something of the meteor. God has passed by. At nightfall, in a meadow near Genappe, Bernard and Bertrand seized by the skirt of his coat and detained a man. Haggard, pensive, sinister, gloomy, who, dragged to that point by the current of the rout, had just dismounted, had passed the bridle of his horse over his arm, and with wild eye was returning alone to Waterloo. It was Napoleon, the immense somnambulist of this dream which had crumbled, essaying once more to advance. End of Book One, Chapter Thirteen Chapter 14 of Book 1 of Les Miserables, Volume 2, by Victor Hugo. Les Miserables, Volume 2, by Victor Hugo. Translated by Isabel Florence Hapgood. Book 1st, Waterloo. Chapter 14, The Last Square. Several squares of the guard, motionless amid this stream of the defeat, as rocks in running water, held their own until night. Night came, death also. They awaited that double shadow, and, invincible, allowed themselves to be enveloped therein. Each regiment, isolated from the rest, and having no bond with the army, now shattered in every part, died alone. They had taken up position for this final action, some on the heights of Rossomme, others on the plain of Mont-Saint-Jean. There, abandoned, vanquished, terrible, those gloomy squares endured their death-throes in formidable fashion. Ulm, Wagram, Jena, Friedland died with them. At twilight, towards nine o'clock in the evening, one of them was left at the foot of the plateau of Mont-Saint-Jean. In that fatal valley, at the foot of that declivity which the cuirassier had ascended, now inundated by the masses of the English, under the converging fires of the victorious, hostile cavalry, under a frightful density of projectiles, this square fought on. It was commanded by an obscure officer named Combronne. At each discharge the square diminished and replied— it replied to the grape-shot with a fusillade, continually contracting its four walls. The fugitives, pausing breathless for a moment in the distance, listened in the darkness to that gloomy and ever-decreasing thunder. When this legion had been reduced to a handful, when nothing was left of their flag but a rag, when their guns, the bullets all gone, were no longer anything but clubs, when the heap of corpses was larger than the group of survivors. There reigned among the conquerors, around those men dying so sublimely, a sort of sacred terror, and the English artillery, taking breath, became silent. This furnished a sort of respite, these combatants had around them something in the nature of a swarm of spectres. Silhouettes of men on horseback, the black profiles of cannon, the white sky viewed through wheels and gun carriages, the colossal death's head which the heroes saw constantly through the smoke 
in the depths of the battle, advanced upon them and gazed at them. Through the shades of twilight they could hear the pieces being loaded, the matches all lighted, like the eyes of tigers at night, formed a circle round their heads. All the linstocks of the English batteries approached the cannons, and then, with emotion, holding the supreme moment suspended above these men, an English general, Colville according to some, Maitland according to others, shouted to them, "'Surrender, brave Frenchmen!' Combron replied, blank. Editor's Commentary, another edition of this book, has the word merde in lieu of the blank above. End of Book First, Chapter 14 Chapter 15 of Book 1 of Les Miserables, Volume 2, by Victor Hugo Les Miserables, Volume 2, by Victor Hugo Translated by Isabel Florence Hapgood Book First, Waterloo Chapter 15, Cambron If any French reader object to having his susceptibilities offended, one would have to refrain from repeating in his presence what is perhaps the finest reply that a Frenchman ever made. This would enjoin us from consigning something sublime to history. At our own risk and peril, let us violate this injunction. Now then, among those giants there was one titan, Combronne. To make that reply, and then perish, what could be grander? For being willing to die is the same as to die, and it was not this man's fault if he survived after he was shot. The winner of the Battle of Waterloo was not Napoleon, who was put to flight, nor Wellington, giving way at four o'clock, in despair at five, nor Blücher, who took no part in the engagement. The winner of Waterloo was Combron. To thunder forth such a reply at the lightning flash that kills you is to conquer. Thus to answer the catastrophe, thus to speak to fate, to give this pedestal to the future lion, to hurl such a challenge to the midnight rainstorm, to the treacherous wall of Hougoumont, to the sunken road of Ouin, to Grouchy's delay, to Blücher's arrival, to be irony itself in the tomb, to act so as to stand upright though fallen to drown in two syllables the European coalition, to offer kings privies which the Caesars once knew, to make the lowest of words the most lofty by entwining with it the glory of France, insolently to end Waterloo with Mardi Gras, to finish Leonidas with Rabelais to set the crown on this victory by a word impossible to speak, to lose the field and preserve history, to have the laugh on your side after such a carnage, this is immense. It was an insult such as a thundercloud might hurl. It reaches the grandeur of Aeschylus. Combron's reply produces the effect of a violent break, tis like the breaking of a heart under a weight of scorn. Tis the overflow of agony bursting forth. Who conquered? Wellington? No. Had it not been for Blücher, he was lost. Was it Blücher? No. If Wellington had not begun, Blücher could not have finished. This Combron... This man spending his last hour, this unknown soldier, this infinitesimal of war, realises that here is a falsehood, a falsehood in a catastrophe, and so doubly agonising. And at the moment when his rage is bursting forth because of it, he is offered this mockery, life. How could he restrain himself? Yonder are all the kings of Europe, 
the generals flushed with victory, the Jupiter's darting thunderbolts. They have a hundred thousand victorious soldiers, and back of the hundred thousand a million. Their cannon stand with yawning mouths, the match is lighted. They grind down under their heels the imperial guards and the grand army. They have just crushed Napoleon, and only Cambronne remains. Only this earthworm is left to protest. He will protest. Then he seeks for the appropriate word as one seeks for a sword. His mouth froths, and the froth is the word. In face of this mean and mighty victory, in face of this victory which counts none victorious, this desperate soldier stands erect. He grants its overwhelming immensity, but he establishes its triviality. And he does more than spit upon it. Born down by numbers, by superior force, by brute matter, he finds in his soul an expression, excrement. We repeat it, to use that word, to do thus, to invent such an expression, is to be the conqueror. The spirit of mighty days at that portentous moment made its descent on that unknown man. Cambronne invents the word for Waterloo, as Rouget invents the Marseillaise under the visitation of a breath from on high. An emanation from the divine whirlwind leaps forth and comes sweeping over these men, and they shake, and one of them sings the song supreme, and the other utters the frightful cry. This challenge of titanic scorn Cambronne hurls not only at Europe in the name of the Empire, that would be a trifle. He hurls it at the past in the name of the Revolution. It is heard, and Cambronne is recognised as possessed by the ancient spirit of the Titans. Danton seems to be speaking, Kleber seems to be bellowing. At that word from Cambronne, the English voice responded, Fire! The batteries flamed, the hill trembled, from all those brazen mouths belched a last terrible gush of grape-shot. A vast volume of smoke, vaguely white in the light of the rising moon, rolled out, and when the smoke dispersed, there was no longer anything there. That formidable remnant had been annihilated. The guard was dead. The four walls of the living redoubt lay prone, and hardly was there discernible here and there even a quiver in the bodies. It was thus that the French legions, greater than the Roman legions, expired on Mont Saint-Jean on the soil watered with rain and blood, amid the gloomy grain, on the spot where nowadays Joseph, who drives the post-wagon from Nivelle, passes whistling and cheerfully whipping up his horse at four o'clock in the morning. End of Book First, Chapter 15 Chapter 16 of Book First of Les Miserables, Volume 2, by Victor Hugo Les Miserables, Volume 2, by Victor Hugo Translated by Isabel Florence Hapgood Book First, Waterloo Chapter 16, Quot Libras in Duce The Battle of Waterloo is an enigma. It is as obscure to those who won it as to those who lost it. For Napoleon, it was a panic. Blucher sees nothing in it but fire. Wellington understands nothing in regard to it. Look at the reports. The bulletins are confused, the commentaries involved. Some stammer, others lisp. Germany divides the Battle of Waterloo into four moments. Muffling cuts it up into three changes. Charas alone, though we hold another judgment than his on some points, 
seized with his haughty glance the characteristic outlines of that catastrophe of human genius in conflict with divine chance. All the other historians suffer from being somewhat dazzled, and in this dazzled state they fumble about. It was a day of lightning brilliancy, in fact a crumbling of the military monarchy which, to the vast stupefaction of kings, drew all the kingdoms after it, the fall of force, the defeat of war. In this event, stamped with superhuman necessity, the part played by men amounts to nothing. If we take Waterloo from Wellington and Blotcher, do we thereby deprive England and Germany of anything? No, neither that illustrious England nor that august Germany enter into the problem of Waterloo. Thank heaven, nations are great, independently of the lugubrious feats of the sword. Neither England nor Germany nor France is contained in a scabbard. At this epoch, when Waterloo is only a clashing of swords, above Blucher, Germany has Schiller. Above Wellington, England has Byron. A vast dawn of ideas is the peculiarity of our century, and in that aurora, England and Germany have a magnificent radiance. They are majestic because they think. The elevation of level which they contribute to civilization is intrinsic with them. It proceeds from themselves and not from an accident. The aggrandizement which they have brought to the nineteenth century has not Waterloo as its source. It is only barbarous people who undergo rapid growth after a victory. That is the temporary vanity of torrents swelled by a storm. Civilized people, especially in our day, are neither elevated nor abased by the good or bad fortune of a captain. Their specific gravity in the human species results from something more than a combat. Their honor, thank God, their dignity, their intelligence, their genius, are not numbers which those gamblers, heroes and conquerors can put in the lottery of battles. Often a battle is lost and progress is conquered. There is less glory and more liberty. The drum holds its peace, reason takes the word. It is a game in which he who loses wins. Let us, therefore, speak of Waterloo coldly from both sides. Let us render to chance that which is due to chance, and to God that which is due to God. What is Waterloo? A victory? No, the winning number in the lottery. The quine, won by Europe, paid by France. It was not worth while to place a lion there. Waterloo, moreover, is the strangest encounter in history. Napoleon and Wellington. They are not enemies, they are opposites. Never did God, who is fond of antithesis, make a more striking contrast, a more extraordinary comparison. On one side, precision, foresight, geometry, prudence, an assured retreat, Reserve spared, with an obstinate coolness, an imperturbable method, strategy, which takes advantage of the ground, tactics, which preserve the equilibrium of battalions, carnage, executed according to rule, war regulated, watch in hand, nothing voluntarily left to chance, the ancient classic courage, absolute regularity. On the other, intuition, divination, military oddity, superhuman instinct, a flaming glance, an indescribable something which gazes like an eagle and which strikes like the lightning, a prodigious art in disdainful impetuosity, all the mysteries of a profound soul associated with destiny, the stream, the plain, the forest, the hill, summoned and in a manner forced to obey, the despot going even so far as to tyrannize over the field of battle. Faith in a star mingled with strategic science, elevating but perturbing it. Wellington was the barim of war. Napoleon was its Michelangelo. And on this occasion, genius was vanquished by calculation. On both sides someone was awaited. It was the exact calculator who succeeded. Napoleon was waiting for Grouchy. He did not come. Wellington expected Blucher. He came. Wellington is classic war taking its revenge. 
Bonaparte, at his dawning, had encountered him in Italy and beaten him superbly. The old owl had fled before the young vulture. The old tactics had been not only struck as by lightning, but disgraced. Who was that Corsican of six and twenty? What signified that splendid ignoramus who, with everything against him, nothing in his favor, without provisions, without ammunition, without cannon, without shoes, almost without an army, with a mere handful of men against masses, hurled himself on Europe combined, and absurdly won victories in the impossible? Whence had issued that fulminating convict, who almost without taking breath, and with the same set of combatants in hand, pulverized one after the other the five armies of the Emperor of Germany, upsetting Beaulieu on Alvinci, Wormsa on Beaulieu, Melas on Wormsa, Mac on Melas? Who was this novice in war with the effrontery of a luminary? The academical military school excommunicated him, and as it lost its footing. Hence, the implacable rancor of the old Caesarism against the new, of the regular sword against the flaming sword, and of the exchequer against genius. On the 18th of June, 1815, that rancor had the last word, and beneath Lodi, Montebello, Montenote, Mantua, Arcola, it wrote Waterloo, a triumph of the mediocres which is sweet to the majority. Destiny consented to this irony. In his decline, Napoleon found Wormser, the younger, again in front of him. In fact, to get Wormser, it sufficed to blanch the hair of Wellington. Waterloo is a battle of the first order, won by a captain of the second. That which must be admired in the Battle of Waterloo is England. The English firmness, the English resolution, the English blood. The superb thing about England there, no offense to her, was herself. It was not her captain, it was her army. Wellington, oddly ungrateful, declares in a letter to Lord Bathurst that his army, the army which fought on the 18th of June, 1815, was a detestable army. What does that somber intermingling of bones buried beneath the furrows of Waterloo think of that? England has been too modest in the matter of Wellington. To make Wellington so great is to belittle England. Wellington is nothing but a hero like many another. Those Scotch greys, those horse guards, those regiments of Maitland and of Mitchell, that infantry of Pack and Kempt, that cavalry of Ponsonby and Somerset, those highlanders playing the pibroch under the shower of grapeshot, those battalions of Ryland, those utterly raw recruits, who hardly knew how to handle a musket holding their own against Esling's and Rivoli's old troops, that is what was grand. Wellington was tenacious, in that lay his merit, and we are not seeking to lessen it, but the least of his foot soldiers and of his cavalry would have been as solid as he. The iron soldier is worth as much as the iron duke. As for us, all our glorification goes to the English soldier, to the English army, to the English people. If trophy there be, it is to England that the trophy is due. The column of Waterloo would be more just if, instead of the figure of a man, it bore on high the statue of a people. But this great England will be angry at what we are saying here. She still cherishes, after her own 1688 and our 1789, the feudal illusion. She believes in heredity and hierarchy. These people, surpassed by none in power and glory, regards itself as a nation, and not as a people. And as a people, it willingly subordinates itself and takes a lord for its head. As a workman, it allows itself to be disdained. As a soldier, it allows itself to be flogged. It will be remembered that at the Battle of Inkerman a sergeant who had, it appears, saved the army, could not be mentioned by Lord Paglen, 
as the English military hierarchy does not permit any hero below the grade of an officer to be mentioned in the reports. That which we admire above all, in an encounter of the nature of Waterloo, is the marvelous cleverness of chance. A nocturnal rain, the wall of Rugamond, the hollow road of Ohain, Grouchy deaf to the cannon, Napoleon's guide deceiving him, Bellow's guide enlightening him, the whole of this cataclysm is wonderfully conducted. On the whole, let us say it plainly, it was more of a massacre than of a battle at Waterloo. Of all pitched battles, Waterloo is the one which has the smallest front for such a number of combatants. Napoleon three-quarters of a league, Wellington half a league, seventy-two thousand combatants on each side. From these denseness the carnage arose. The following calculation has been made, and the following proportion established. Loss of men at Austerlitz, French, fourteen per cent. Russians, thirty per cent. Austrians, forty-four per cent. At Wagram, French, thirteen per cent. Austrians, fourteen. At the Moskowa, French, thirty-seven per cent. Russians, forty-four. At Bautzen, French, thirteen per cent. Russians and Prussians, fourteen. At Waterloo, French, fifty-six per cent. The Allies, thirty-one. Total for Waterloo, forty-one per cent. One hundred and forty-four thousand combatants, sixty thousand dead. Today the field of Waterloo has the calm which belongs to the earth, the impassive support of a man, and it resembles all plains. At night, moreover, a sort of visionary mist arises from it, and if a traveller strolls there, if he listens, if he watches, if he dreams like Virgil in the fatal plains of Philippi, the hallucination of the catastrophe takes possession of him. The frightful 18th of June lives again. The false monumental hillock disappears, the lion vanishes in air, the battlefield resumes its reality, lines of infantry undulate over the plain, furious gallops traverse the horizon, the frightened dreamer beholds the flash of sabers, the gleam of bayonets, the flare of bombs, the tremendous interchange of thunders. He hears, as it were, the death rattle in the depth of a tomb, the vague clamor of the battle phantom. Those shadows are grenadiers, those lights are cuirassiers. That skeleton Napoleon, that other skeleton is Wellington. All this no longer exists, and yet it clashes together and combats still, and the ravines are empurpled, and the trees quiver, and there is fury even in the clouds and in the shadows. All those terrible heights, Hougomont, Mont Saint Jean, Frichemont, Papelotte, Plancenois, appear confusedly crowned with whirlwinds of spectres engaged in exterminating each other. End of Book First, Chapter Sixteen. Chapter Seventeen of Book One of Les Misérables, Volume Two by Victor Hugo. Les Miserables, Volume Two by Victor Hugo, translated by Isabel Florence Hapgood. Book First, Waterloo, Chapter Seventeen. Is Waterloo to be considered good? There exists a very respectable liberal school which does not hate Waterloo. We do not belong to it. To us, Waterloo is but the stupefied date of liberty. That such an eagle should emerge from such an egg is certainly unexpected. If one places oneself at the culminating point of view of the question, Waterloo is intentionally a counter-revolutionary victory. It is Europe against France. It is Petersburg, Berlin and Vienna against Paris. It is the status quo against the initiative. It is the 14th of July, 1789, attacked through the 20th of March, 1815. It is the monarchies clearing the decks in opposition to the indomitable French rioting. The final extinction of that vast people, which had been in eruption for 26 years, 
Such was the dream. The solidarity of the Brunswicks, the Nassaus, the Romanovs, the Hohenzollerns, the Habsburgs, with the Bourbons. Waterloo bears divine right on its crupper. It is true that the empire having been despotic, the kingdom by the natural reaction of things was forced to be liberal, and that a constitutional order was the unwilling result of Waterloo, to the great regret of the conquerors. It is because revolution cannot really be conquered, and that, being providential and absolutely fatal, it is always cropping up afresh. Before Waterloo, in Bonaparte overthrowing the old thrones, after Waterloo, in Louis the Eighteenth granting and conforming to the Charter, Bonaparte places a postillion on the throne of Naples, and a sergeant on the throne of Sweden, employing inequality to demonstrate equality. Louis the Eighteenth at saint Ouen countersigns the Declaration of the Rights of Man. If you wish to gain an idea of what revolution is, call it progress. And if you wish to acquire an idea of the nature of progress, call it tomorrow. Tomorrow fulfils its work irresistibly, and it is already fulfilling it today. It always reaches its goal strangely. It employs Wellington to make of Foy, who was only a soldier, an orator. Foy falls at Hougoumont and rises again in the tribune. Thus does progress proceed. There is no such thing as a bad tool for that workman. It does not become disconcerted, but adjusts to its divine work the man who has bestridden the Alps and the good old tottering invalid of Father Elise. It makes use of the gouty man as well as of the conqueror, of the conqueror without, of the gouty man within. Waterloo, by cutting short the demolition of European thrones by the sword, had no other effect than to cause the revolutionary work to be continued in another direction. The slashers have finished. It was the turn of the thinkers. The century that Waterloo was intended to arrest has pursued its march. That sinister victory was vanquished by liberty. In short, and incontestably, that which triumphed at Waterloo that which smiled in Wellington's rear, that which brought him all the marshal's staffs of Europe, including, it is said, the staff of a marshal of France, that which joyously trundled the barrows full of bones to erect the knoll of the lion, that which triumphantly inscribed on that pedestal the date June the 18th, 1815, that which encouraged Blücher as he put the flying army to the sword, that which from the heights of the plateau of Mont-Saint-Jean hovered over France as over its prey, was the counter-revolution. It was the counter-revolution which murmured that infamous word, dismemberment. On arriving in Paris, it beheld the crater close at hand, it felt those ashes which scorched its feet, and it changed its mind. It returned to the stammer of a charter. Let us behold in Waterloo only that which is in Waterloo. Of intentional liberty there is none. The counter-revolution was involuntarily liberal, in the same manner as, by a corresponding phenomenon, Napoleon was involuntarily revolutionary. On the 18th of June, 1815, the mounted Robespierre was hurled from his saddle. End of Book First, Chapter Seventeen. Chapter Eighteen of Book One of Les Misérables, Volume Two, by Victor Hugo. Les Misérables, Volume Two, by Victor Hugo, translated by Isabel Florence Hapgood. Book One, Waterloo, Chapter Eighteen: A Recrudescence of Divine Right. End of the Dictatorship. A whole European system crumbled away. The empire sank into a gloom which resembled that of the Roman world as it expired. 
Again we behold the abyss, as in the days of the barbarians. Only the barbarism of 1815, which must be called by its pet name of the counter-revolution, was not long breathed, soon felt a panting and halted short. The empire was bewept, let us acknowledge that fact, and bewept by heroic eyes. If glory lies in the sword converted into a scepter, the empire had been glory in person. It had diffused over the earth all the light which tyranny can give a sombre light. We will say more, an obscure light. Compared to the true daylight, it is night. This disappearance of night produces the effect of an eclipse. Louis the Eighteenth re-entered Paris. The circling dances of the 8th of July effaced the enthusiasms of the 20th of March. The Corsican became the antithesis of the Biennese. The flag on the dome of the Trilleries was white. The exile reigned. Hartwell's pine table took its place in front of the fleur-de-lis strewn throne of Louis the Fourteenth. Bouvines and Fontenoy were mentioned as though they had taken place on the preceding day, Austerlitz having become antiquated. The altar and the throne fraternized majestically. One of the most undisputed forms of health of society in the 19th century was established over France and over the continent. Europe adopted the white cockade. Trestaillot was celebrated. The device non pluribus impar reappeared on the stone rays representing a sun upon the front of the barracks on the Quai d'Orsay. Where there had been an imperial guard, there was now a red house. The Arc de Gawassel, all laden with badly born victories, thrown out of its element among these novelties, a little ashamed it may be, of Marengo and Arcola, extricated itself from its predicament with the statue of Duc d'Angoulême. The cemetery of the Madeleine, a terrible pauper's grave in 1793, was covered with jasper and marble, since the bones of Louis the Sixteenth and Mary Antoinette lay in the dust. In the moat of Vassen, a sepulchral shaft sprang from the earth, recalling the fact that the Duc d'Anguia had perished in the very month when Napoleon was crowned. Pope Pius the Seventh, who had performed the coronation very near this death, tranquilly bestowed his blessing on the fall as he had bestowed it on the elevation. At Chunboin there was a little shadow, aged four, whom it was seditious to call the King of Rome. And these things took place, and the kings resumed their thrones, and the master of Europe was put in a cage, and the old regime became the new regime, and all the shadows and all the light of the earth changed place, because, on the afternoon of a certain summer's day, a shepherd said to a Prussian in the forest, Go this way, and not that. This 1815 was a sort of lugubrious April. Ancient and healthy and poisonous realities were covered with new appearances. A lie wedded 1789, the right divine was masked under a charter. Fictions became constitutional, prejudices, superstitions and mental reservations, with Article 14 in the heart, were varnished over with liberalism. It was the serpent's change of skin. Man had been rendered both greater and smaller by Napoleon. Under this reign of splendid matter, the ideal had received the strange name of ideology. It is a grave imprudence in a great man to turn the future into derision. The populace, however, that food for cannon which is so fond of the cannoneer, sought him with its glance. Where is he? What is he doing? Napoleon is dead, said a passer-by to a veteran of Marengo and Waterloo. He is dead, cried the soldier. You don't know him. Imagination distrusted this man, even when overthrown. The depths of Europe were full of darkness after Waterloo. Something enormous remained long empty through Napoleon's disappearance. The kings placed themselves in this void. Ancient Europe profited by it to undertake reforms. There was a holy alliance, belle alliance, beautiful alliance, the fatal field of Waterloo had said in advance. In presence, and in face of that antique Europe reconstructed, the features of a new France were sketched out. The future, which the Emperor had rallied, made its entry. On its brow it bore the star, liberty. The glowing eyes of all young generations were turned on it. Singular fact, people were, at one and the same time, in love with the future, liberty, and the past, Napoleon. Defeat had rendered the vanquished greater. Bonaparte fallen seemed more lofty than Napoleon erect. Those who had triumphed were alarmed. England had him guarded by Hudson Lowe, and France had him watched by Montchenu. His folded arms became a source of uneasiness to thrones. Alexander called him My Sleeplessness. The terror was the result of the quantity of revolution which was contained in him. This is what explains and excuses Bonapartist liberalism. This phantom caused the old world to tremble. The kings reigned, but ill at their ease, with the rock of St. Helena on the horizon. While Napoleon was passing through the death struggle at Longwood, the sixty thousand men who had fallen on the field of Waterloo were quietly rotting, and something of their peace was shed abroad over the world. The Congress of Vienna made the treaties in 1815, and Europe called this the Restoration. This is what Waterloo was. But what matters it to the infinite? 
All that tempest, all that cloud, that war, then that peace, all that darkness did not trouble for a moment the light of the immense eye before which a grub skipping from one blade of grass to another equals the eagle soaring from belfry to belfry on the towers of Notre Dame. End of Book One, Chapter Eighteen. Chapter Nineteen of Book One of Les Miserables, Volume Two by Victor Hugo. Les Miserables, Volume Two by Victor Hugo. Translated by Isabel Florence Hapgood. Book First, Waterloo, Chapter Nineteen, The Battlefield at Night. Let us return. It is a necessity in this book to that fatal battlefield. On the eighteenth of June, the moon was full. Its light favored Blucher's ferocious pursuit, betrayed the traces of the fugitives, delivered up that disastrous mass to the eager Prussian cavalry, and aided the massacre. Such tragic favors of the night do occur sometimes during catastrophes. After the last cannon shot had been fired, the plain of Mont Saint Jean remained deserted. The English occupied the encampment of the French. It is the usual sign of victory to sleep in the bed of the vanquished. They established their bivouac beyond Rassam. The Prussians, let loose on the retreating route, pushed forward. Wellington went to the village of Waterloo to draw up his report to Lord Bathurst. If ever the sick vos non vobis was applicable, it certainly is to that village of Waterloo. Waterloo took no part and lay half a league from the scene of action. Mont Saint Jean was cannonaded, Hougomont was burned, La Haisson was taken by assault, Papelot was burned, Plancenoit was burned. La Belle Alliance beheld the embrace of the two conquerors. These names are hardly known, and Waterloo, which worked not in the battle, bears off all the honor. We are not of the number of those who flatter war. When the occasion presents itself, we tell the truth about it. War has frightful beauties which we have not concealed. It has also, we acknowledge, some hideous features. One of the most surprising is the prompt stripping of the bodies of the dead after the victory. The dawn which follows a battle always rises on naked corpses. Who does this? Who thus soils the triumph? What hideous furtive hand is that which is slipped into the pocket of victory? What pickpockets are they who ply their trade in the rear of glory? Some philosophers, Voltaire among the number, affirm that it is precisely those persons have made the glory. It is the same men, they say. There is no relief corps. Those who are erect pillage those who are prone on the earth. The hero of the day is the vampire of the night. One has assuredly the right, after all. To strip a corpse a bit when one is the author of that corpse. For our own part, we do not think so. It seems to us impossible that the same hand should pluck laurels and purloin the shoes from a dead man. One thing is certain, which is that generally after conquerors follow thieves. But let us leave the soldier, especially the contemporary soldier, out of the question. Every army has a rear guard. And it is that which must be blamed. Bat-like creatures, half brigands and lackeys, all the sorts of vespertios that that twilight called war engenders, wearers of uniforms who take no part in the fighting, pretended invalids, formidable limpers, interloping sutlers, trotting along in little carts, sometimes accompanied by their wives, and stealing things which they sell again, beggars offering themselves as guides to officers. Soldiers, servants, marauders, armies on the march in days gone by, we are not speaking of the present, dragged all this behind them, so that in the special language they are called stragglers. No army, no nation was responsible for those beings. They spoke Italian and followed the Germans, then spoke French and followed the English. It was by one of these wretches, a Spanish straggler who spoke French. That the Marquis of Fervac, deceived by his Picard jargon, and taking him for one of our own men, was traitorously slain and robbed on the battlefield itself in the course of the night which followed the victory of Cerisole. The rascal sprang from this marauding. The detestable maxim "Live on the enemy" produced this leprosy, which a strict discipline alone could heal. There are reputations which are deceptive. One does not always know why certain generals. Great in other directions, have been so popular. Turenne was adored by his soldiers because he tolerated pillage. 
evil permitted constitutes part of goodness. Turenne was so good that he allowed the Palatinate to be delivered over to fire and blood. The marauders in the train of an army were more or less in number, according as the chief was more or less severe. Hulk and Marceau had no stragglers, Wellington had few, and we do him the justice to mention it. Nevertheless, on the night of the 18th to the 19th of June, the dead were robbed. Wellington was rigid. He gave orders that anyone caught in the act should be shot. But Rapine is tenacious. The marauders stole in one corner of the battlefield, while others were being shot in another. The moon was sinister over this plain. Towards midnight, a man was prowling about, or rather climbing in the direction of the hollow road of Oain. To all appearance, he was one of those whom we have just described, neither English nor French, neither peasant nor soldier, less a man than a ghoul attracted by the scent of the dead bodies, having theft for his victory, and come to riffle Waterloo. He was clad in a blouse that was something like a greatcoat. He was uneasy and audacious. He walked forwards and gazed behind him. Who was this man? The knight probably knew more of him than the day. He had no sack, but evidently he had large pockets under his coat. From time to time he halted, scrutinized the plain around him, as though to see whether he were observed, bent over abruptly, disturbed something silent and motionless on the ground, then rose and fled. His sliding motion, his attitudes, his mysterious and rapid gestures, caused him to resemble those twilight larvae which haunt ruins, and which ancient Norman legends call the allures. Certain nocturnal waiting birds produce these silhouettes among the marshes. A glance capable of piercing all that mist deeply would have perceived at some distance a sort of little sutler's wagon with a fluted wicker hood, harnessed to a famished nag which was cropping the grass across its bit as it halted, hidden as it were, behind the hovel which adjoins the highway to Nive, at the angle of the road from Mont Saint-Jean to brain -Alude and in the wagon a sort of woman seated on coffers and packages. Perhaps there was some connection between that wagon and that prowler. The darkness was serene, not a cloud in the zenith. What matters if the earth be red? The moon remains white. These are the indifferences of the sky. In the fields, branches of trees broken by grape-shot, but not fallen, upheld by their bark, sway gently in the breeze of night. A breath, almost a respiration, moved the shrubbery. Quivers which resembled the departure of souls ran through the grass. In the distance, the coming and going of patrols and the general rounds of the English camp were audible. Ugamah and La Haisan continued to burn, forming, one in the west, the other in the east, two great flames which were joined by the cordon of bivouac fires of the English, like a necklace of rubies with two carbuncles at the extremities, as they extended in an immense semicircle over the hills along the horizon. We have described the catastrophe of the road of Owain. The heart is terrified at the thought of what that death must have been to so many brave men. If there is anything terrible, if there exists a reality which surpasses dreams, it is this. To live, to see the sun, to be in full possession of virile force, to possess health and joy, to laugh valiantly to rush towards a glory which one sees dazzling in front of one, to feel in one's breast lungs which breathe, a heart which beats, a will which reasons, to speak, think, hope, love, to have a mother, to have a wife, to have children, to have the light, and all at once, in the space of a shout, in less than a minute, to sink into an abyss, to fall, to roll, to crush, to be crushed, to see ears of wheat, flowers, leaves, branches, not to be able to catch hold of anything, to feel one's sword useless, men beneath one, horses on top of one, to struggle in vain since one's bones have been broken by some kick in the darkness, to feel a heel which makes one's eyes start from their sockets, to bite horses' shoes in one's rage, to stifle, to yell, to writhe, to be beneath and to say to oneself, but just a little while ago I was a living man. There, where that lamentable disaster had uttered its death rattle, all was silence now. The edges of the hollow road were encumbered with horses and riders, inextricably heaped up, 
terrible entanglement. There was no longer any slope, for the corpses had leveled the road with the plain, and reached the brim like a well-filled bushel of barley. A heap of dead bodies in the upper part, a river of blood in the lower part. Such was that road on the evening of the 18th of June, 1815. The blood ran even to Venive Highway, and there overflowed in a large pool in front of the abatis of trees which barred the way, at a spot which is still pointed out. It will be remembered that it was at the opposite point, in the direction of the Genap Road, that the destruction of the cuirassiers had taken place. The thickness of the layer of bodies was proportioned to the depth of the hollow road. Toward the middle, at the point where it became level, where Delors' division had passed, the layer of corpses was thinner. The nocturnal prowler whom we had just shown to the reader was going in that direction. He was searching that vast tomb. He gazed about. He passed the dead in some sort of hideous review. He walked with his feet in the blood. All at once he paused. A few paces in front of him, in the hollow road, at the point where the pile of dead came to an end, an open hand, illumined by the moon, projected from beneath that heap of men. That hand had on its finger something sparkling, which was a ring of gold. The man bent over, remained in a crouching attitude for a moment, and when he rose there was no longer a ring on the hand. He did not precisely rise. He remained in a stooping and frightened attitude, with his back turned to the heap of dead, scanning the horizon on his knees, with the whole upper portion of his body supported on his two forefingers, which rested on the earth and his head peering above the edge of the hollow road. The jackal's four paws suit some actions. Then coming to a decision, he rose to his feet. At that moment he gave a terrible start. He felt someone clutch him from behind. He wheeled round. It was the open hand, which had closed, and had seized the skirt of his coat. An honest man would have been terrified. This man burst into a laugh. Come, said he. It's only a dead body. I prefer spook to a gendarme. But the hand weakened and released him. Effort is quickly exhausted in the grave. Well now, said the prowler. Is that dead fellow alive? Let's see. He bent down again, fumbled among the heap, pushed aside everything that was in his way, seized the hand, grasped the arm, freed the head, pulled out the body, and a few moments later he was dragging the lifeless, or at least the unconscious man, through the shadows of the hollow road. He was a crassier, an officer, and even an officer of considerable rank. A large gold epaulet peeped from beneath the cuirass. This officer no longer possessed a helmet. A furious sword cut had scarred his face, where nothing was discernible but blood. However, he did not appear to have any broken limbs, and by some happy chance, if that word is permissible here, the dead had been vaulted above him in such a manner as to preserve him from being crushed. His eyes were still closed. On his caress he wore the silver cross of a legion of honor. The prowler tore off this cross, which disappeared into one of the gulfs which he had beneath his great coat. Then he felt of the officer's fob, discovered a watch there, and took possession of it. Next he searched his waistcoat, found a purse, and pocketed it. When he arrived at this stage of succor, which he was administering to this dying man, the officer opened his eyes. Thanks, he said feebly. The abruptness of the movements of the man who was manipulating him, the freshness of the night, the air which he could inhale freely, had roused him from his lethargy. The prowler made no reply. He raised his head. A sound of footsteps was audible in the plain. Some patrol was probably approaching. The officer murmured, for the death agony was still in his voice. Who won the battle? The English, answered the prowler. The officer went on. Look in my pockets. You will find a watch and a purse. Take them. It was already done. The prowler executed the required feint, and said, There is nothing there. I have been robbed, said the officer. I am sorry for that. You should have had them. The steps of the patrol became more and more distinct. Someone is coming, said the prowler, with the movement of a man who was taking his departure. 
The officer raised his arm feebly and detained him. You have saved my life. Who are you? The prowler answered rapidly and in a low voice. Like yourself, I belong to the French army. I must leave you. If they were to catch me, they would shoot me. I have saved your life. Now get out of the scrape yourself. What is your rank? Sergeant. What is your name? Thénardier. I shall not forget that name, said the officer. And do you remember mine? My name is Pomercy. End of Book One, Chapter Nineteen. Chapter One of Book Two of Les Misérables, Volume Two by Victor Hugo. Les Misérables, Volume Two by Victor Hugo, translated by Isabel Florence Hapgood. Book Two, The Ship Orion, Chapter One. Number two four six zero one becomes number nine four three zero. Jean Valjean had been recaptured. The reader will be grateful to us if we pass rapidly over the sad details. We will confine ourselves to transcribing two paragraphs published by the journals of that day, a few months after the surprising events which had taken place at Montreuil sur Mer. These articles are rather summary. It must be remembered that at that epoch the Gazette des Tribunaux was not yet in existence. We borrow the first from the Drapeau Blanc. It bears the date of July twenty fifth, eighteen twenty three. An arrondissement of the Pas de Calais has just been the theatre of an event quite out of the ordinary course. A man who was a stranger in the department and who bore the name of Monsieur Madeleine, had, thanks to the new methods, resuscitated some years ago an ancient local industry, the manufacture of jet and of black glass trinkets. He had made his fortune in the business, and that of the arrondissement as well, we will admit. He had been appointed mayor in recognition of his services. The police discovered that Monsieur Madeleine was no other than an ex-convict who had broken his ban condemned in 1796 for theft, and named Jean Valjean. Jean Valjean has been recommitted to prison. It appears that previous to his arrest he had succeeded in withdrawing from the hands of Monsieur Lafitte a sum of over half a million which he had lodged there, and which he had, moreover, and by perfectly legitimate means, acquired in his business. No one has been able to discover where Jean Valjean has concealed this money since his return to prison at Toulon. The second article, which enters a little more into detail, is an extract from the Journal de Paris of the same date. A former convict who had been liberated, named Jean Valjean, has just appeared before the court of assizes of the VAR under circumstances calculated to attract attention. This wretch had succeeded in escaping the vigilance of the police. He had changed his name, and had succeeded in getting himself appointed mayor of one of our small northern towns. In this town he had established a considerable commerce. He has at last been unmasked and arrested, thanks to the indefatigable zeal of the public prosecutor. He had for his concubine a woman of the town, who died of a shock at the moment of his arrest. This scoundrel, who is endowed with Herculean strength, found means to escape. But three or four days after his flight, the police laid their hands on him once more, in Paris itself, at the very moment when he was entering one of those little vehicles which run between the capital and the village of Montfermeil, seine was. He is said to have profited by this interval of three or four days of liberty to withdraw a considerable sum deposited by him with one of our leading bankers. This sum has been estimated at six or seven hundred thousand francs. If the indictment is to be trusted, he has hidden it in some place known to himself alone, and it has not been possible to lay hands on it. However that may be, the said Jean Valjean has just been brought before the assizes of the Department of the VAR as accused of highway robbery, accompanied with violence about eight years ago, 
on the person of one of those honest children who, as the patriarch of Ferny has said in immortal verse, arrive from Savoy every year, and who with gentle hands do clear those long canals choked up with soot. This bandit refused to defend himself. It was proved by the skillful and eloquent representative of the public prosecutor that the theft was committed in complicity with others, and that Jean Valjean was a member of a band of robbers in the South. Jean Valjean was pronounced guilty, and was condemned to the death penalty in consequence. This criminal refused to lodge an appeal. The king, in his inexhaustible clemency, has deigned to commute his penalty to that of penal servitude for life. Jean Valjean was immediately taken to the prison at Toulon. The reader has not forgotten that Jean Valjean had religious habits at Montreuil-sur-Mer. Some papers, among others the Constitutional, presented this commutation as a triumph of the priestly party. Jean Valjean changed his number in the galleys. He was called 9430. However, and we will mention it at once, in order that we may not be obliged to recur to the subject. The prosperity of Montreuil-sur-Mer vanished with Monsieur Madeleine. All that he had foreseen during his night of fever and hesitation was realized. Lacking him, there actually was a soul lacking. After this fall, there took place at Montreuil-sur-Mer that egotistical division of great existences which have fallen, that fatal dismemberment of flourishing things, which is accomplished every day, obscurely, in the human community, and which history has noted only once, because it occurred after the death of Alexander. Lieutenants are crowned kings. Superintendents improvise manufacturers out of themselves. Envious rivalries arose. Monsieur Madeleine's vast workshops were shut, his buildings fell to ruin, his workmen were scattered. Some of them quitted the country, others abandoned the trade. Thenceforth, everything was done on a small scale instead of on a grand scale, for lucre instead of the general good. There was no longer a center. Everywhere there was competition and animosity. Monsieur Madeleine had reigned over all and directed all, no sooner had he fallen than each pulled things to himself. The spirit of combat succeeded to the spirit of organization, bitterness to cordiality, hatred of one another to the benevolence of the founder towards all. The threads which Monsieur Madeleine had set were tangled and broken, the methods were adulterated, the products were debased. Confidence was killed. The market diminished for lack of orders. Salaries were reduced, the workshops stood still. Bankruptcy arrived. And then there was nothing more for the poor. All had vanished. The state itself perceived that someone had been crushed somewhere. Less than four years after the judgment of the Court of Assizes, Establishing the identity of Jean Valjean and Monsieur Madeleine for the benefit of the galleys, the cost of collecting taxes had doubled in the arrondissement of Montreuil-sur-Mer, and Monsieur Viel called attention to the fact in the rostrum in the month of February, 1827. End of Book Two, Chapter One. Chapter Two of Book Two of Les Miserables, Volume 2, by Victor Hugo. Les Miserables, Volume 2, by Victor Hugo. Translated by Isabel Florence Hapgood. Book 2nd, The Ship Orion. Chapter 2, in which the reader will peruse two verses which are of the devil's composition, possibly. Before proceeding further, it will be to the purpose to narrate in some detail a singular occurrence which took place at about the same epoch, in Montfermeil, and which is not lacking coincidence with certain conjectures of the indictment. 
There exists in the region of Montfermeil a very ancient superstition, which is all the more curious and all the more precious, because a popular superstition in the vicinity of Paris is like an aloe in Siberia. We are among those who respect everything which is in the nature of a rare plant. Here, then, is the superstition of Montfermeil. It is thought that the devil, from time immemorial, has selected the forest as a hiding place for his treasures. Good wives affirm that it is no rarity to encounter at nightfall, in secluded nooks of the forest, a black man with the air of a carter or a woodchopper, wearing wooden shoes, clad in trousers and a blouse of linen, and recognizable by the fact that, instead of a cap or hat, he has two immense horns on his head. This ought, in fact, to render him recognizable. This man is habitually engaged in digging a hole. There are three ways of profiting by such an encounter. The first is to approach the man and speak to him. Then it is seen that the man is simply a peasant, that he appears black because it is nightfall, that he is not digging any hole whatever, but is cutting grass for his cows, and that what had been taken for horns is nothing but a dung fork which he is carrying on his back, and whose teeth, thanks to the perspective of evening, seem to spring from his head. The man returns home and dies within the week. The second way is to watch him, to wait until he has dug his hole, until he has filled it and has gone away, and then to run with great speed to the trench, to open it once more and seize the treasure which the black man has necessarily placed there. In this case, one dies within the month. Finally, the last method is not to speak to the black man, not to look at him, and to flee at the best speed of one's legs. One then dies within the year. As all three methods are attended with their special inconveniences, the second, which at all events presents some advantages, among others that of possessing a treasure, if only for a month, is the one most generally adopted. So bold men, who are tempted by every chance, have quite frequently, as we are assured, opened the holes excavated by the black man, and tried to rob the devil. The success of the operation appears to be but moderate, at least if the tradition is to be believed and in particular the two enigmatical lines in barbarous Latin, which an evil Norman monk, a bit of a sorcerer, named Tryphon, has left on this subject. This Tryphon is buried at the abbey of Saint-Georges de Bourcherville near Rouen, and toads spawn on his grave. Accordingly, enormous efforts are made. Such trenches are ordinarily extremely deep. A man sweats, digs, toils all night, for it must be done at night. He wets his shirt, burns out his candle, breaks his mattock, and when he arrives at the bottom of the hole, when he lays his hand on the treasure, what does he find? What is the devil's treasure? A sou, sometimes a crown piece, a stone, a skeleton, a bleeding body, sometimes a specter folded in four like a sheet of paper in a portfolio, sometimes nothing. This is what Tryphon's verses seem to announce to the indiscreet and curious. Fudit de in fossa de osores condui opaca, as numas lapides cadaver sumacra nilic. It seems that in our day there is sometimes found a powder horn with bullets, sometimes an old pack of cards, greasy and worn, which has evidently served the devil. Tryphon does not record these two finds. Since Tryphon lived in the twelfth century, and since the devil does not appear to have had the wit to invent powder before Roger Bacon's time, and cards before the time of Charles the Sixth. Moreover, if one plays at cards, one is sure to lose all that one possesses. And as for the powder in the horn, it possesses the property of making your gun burst in your face. Now, a very short time after the epoch, when it seemed that to the prosecuting attorney that the liberated convict, Jean Valjean, during his flight of several days, had been prowling around Montfermeil, it was remarked in that village that a certain old road laborer, named Boulatroy, had peculiar ways in the forest. People thereabouts thought they knew that this Boulatroy had been in the galleys. He was subjected to certain police supervision. And, as he could find work nowhere, the administration employed him at reduced rates as a road-mender on the crossroad, from Gagny to Ligny. This Boulatroy was a man who was viewed with disfavor by the inhabitants of the district, as too respectful, too humble, too prompt in removing his cap to everyone, and trembling and smiling in the presence of the gendarmes, probably affiliated to robber bands, they said, suspected of lying in ambush at verge of copses at nightfall. The only thing in his favor was that he was not a drunkard. This is what people thought they had noticed. Of late, Boulatroy had taken to quitting his task of stone-breaking and care the road at a very early hour, and to be taking himself to the forest with his pickaxe. He was encountered toward evening in the most deserted clearings and the wildest thickets, and he had the appearance of being in search of something, and sometimes he was digging holes. 
The good wives who passed took him at first for Beelzebub. Then they recognized Boulatroy, and were not in the least reassured thereby. These encounters seemed to cause Boulatroy a lively displeasure. It was evident that he sought to hide, and that there was some mystery in what he was doing. It was said in the village, it is clear that the devil has appeared. Boulatroy has seen him, is on the search. In sooth, he is cunning enough to pocket Lucifer's hoard. The Voltarians added, Will Boulatroy catch the devil, or will the devil catch Boulatroy? The old women made a great many signs of the cross. In the meantime, Boulatroy's maneuvers in the forest ceased, and he resumed his regular occupation of road mending, and people gossiped of something else. Some persons, however, were still curious, surmising that in all this there was probably no fabulous treasure of the legends, but some fine windfall of a more serious and palpable sort than the devil's bank builds. The road mender had half discovered the secret. The most puzzled were the schoolmaster and Thénardier, the proprietor of the tavern, who was everybody's friend, and had not disdained to ally himself with Boulatroy. He has been in the galleys, said, said, said Thénardier. A. Eh? No one knows who has been there, who will be there. One evening the schoolmaster affirmed that in former times the law could have instituted an inquiry as to what Boulatroy did in the forest and that the latter would have been forced to speak, and that he would have been put to the torture in case of need, and that Boulatroy would have not resisted the water test, for example. Let us put him to the wine test, said Thénardier. They made an effort and got the old road mender to drinking. Boulatroy drank an enormous amount, but said very little. He combined with admirable art and in masterly proportions the thirst of a grandisier with the discretion of a judge. Nevertheless, by dint of returning to the charge, and of comparing and putting together the few obscure words which he did allow to escape him, this is what Thernadier and the schoolmaster imagined that they had made out. One morning, when Boulatroy was on his way to his work at daybreak, he had been surprised to see, at a nook of the forest in the underbrush, a shovel and a pickaxe, concealed, as one might say. However, he might have supposed that they were probably the shovel and pickaxe of Father Six Fours, the water carrier and would have thought no more about it. But on the evening of that day he saw, without being seen himself, as he was hidden by a large tree, a person who did not belong in those parts, and whom he, Boulatroy, knew well, directing his steps toward the densest part of the wood. Translation by Thernadier, a comrade of the galleys. Boulatroy obstinately refused to reveal his name. This person carried a package, something square, like a large box or a small trunk. Surprise on the part of Boulatroy. However, it was only after the expiration of seven or eight minutes that the idea of following that person had occurred to him. But it was too late. The person had already, was already in the thicket. Night had descended, and Boulatroy had not been able to catch up with him. Then he had adopted the course of watching for him at the edge of the woods. It was moonlight. Two or three hours later, Boulatroy had seen this person emerge from the brushwood, carrying no longer the coffer, but a shovel and pick. Boulatroy had allowed the person to pass, and had not dreamed of accosting him, because, he said to himself, that the other man was three times as strong as he was, and armed with a pickaxe, and that he would probably knock him over the head on recognizing him, and on perceiving that he was recognized. Touching a fusion of two old comrades on meeting again. But the shovel and picket served as a ray of light to Boulatroy. He had hastened to the thicket in the morning, and had found neither shovel nor pick. From this he had drawn the inference that this person, once in the forest, had dug a hole with his pick, buried the coffer, and reclosed the hole with his shovel. Now the coffer was too small to contain a body, therefore it contained money. Hence his researches. Boulatroy had explored, sounded, searched the entire forest and the thicket, and had dug wherever the earth appeared to him to have been recently turned up. In vain. He had ferreted out nothing. No one in Montfermeil thought any more about it. There are only a few brave gossips who said, You may be certain that the mender on the Gagné road did not take all that trouble for nothing. He was sure that the devil had come. End of Book Two, Chapter Two. Chapter Three of Book Two of Les Miserables, Volume Two by Victor Hugo. Les Miserables, Volume Two by Victor Hugo. Translated by Isabel Florence Hapgood. Book Second. The Ship Orion. Chapter 3. The ankle chain must have undergone a certain preparatory manipulation to be thus broken with a blow from a hammer. Towards the end of October, 
in that same year, 1823, the inhabitants of Toulon beheld the entry into their port, after heavy weather, and for the purpose of repairing some damages, of the ship Orion, which was employed later at Brest as a school ship, and which then formed a part of the Mediterranean squadron. This vessel, battered as it was, for the sea had handled it roughly, produced a fine effect as it entered the roads. It flew some colors which procured for it the regulation salute of eleven guns, which it returned shot for shot, total twenty-two. It has been calculated that what with salvos, royal and military politenesses, courteous exchanges of uproar, signals of etiquette, formalities of roadsteads, and citadels, sunrises and sunsets, saluted every day by all fortresses and all ships of war, openings and closings of ports, etc., the civilized world discharged all over the earth in the course of four and twenty hours one hundred and fifty thousand useless shots. At six francs the shot, that comes to nine hundred thousand francs a day, three hundred millions a year, which vanish in smoke. This is a mere detail. All this time the poor were dying of hunger. The year 1823 was what the Restoration called the Epic of the Spanish War. It contained many events in one, and a quantity of peculiarities. A grand family affair for the houses of Bourbon, the branch of France, succoring and protecting the branch of Madrid, that is to say, performing an act devolving on the elder, an apparent return to our national traditions, complicated by servitude and by subjection to the cabinets of the North. Monsieur le Duc de Aglulme, surnomed by the liberal sheets the hero of Andujar, compressing in a triumphal attitude that was somewhat contradicted by his peaceable air, the ancient and very powerful terrorism of the Holy Office, at variance with the chimerical terrorism of the liberals, the sans-culottes resuscitated to the great terror of the dowagers, under the name of Descama, descamisados, monarchy opposing an obstacle to progress described as anarchy, the theories of 89 roughly interrupted in the sap, a European halt called to the French idea, which was making the tour of the world, besides the son of France as Generalissimo, the Prince of Carignan, afterwards Charles Albert, enrolling himself in that crusade of kings against people as a volunteer, with grenadier epaulettes of red worsted, the soldiers of the empire setting out on a fresh campaign, but aged, saddened after eight years of repose and under the white cocade, the tricolored standard waved abroad by a heroic handful of Frenchmen, as the white standard had been thirty years earlier at Koblenetz. Monks mingled with our troops. The spirit of liberty and of novelty brought to its senses by bayonets, principles slaughtered by cannonades, France undoing by her arms that which she had done by her mind. In addition to this, hostile leaders sold, soldiers hesitating, cities besieged by millions, no military perils, and yet possible explosions, as in every mine which is surprised and invaded, but little bloodshed, little honor won, shame for some, glory for no one. Such was this war made by the princes descended from Louis the Fourteenth, and conducted by generals who had been under Napoleon. Its sad fate was to recall neither the grand war nor grand politics. Some feats of arms were serious. The taking of the Trocare, Trocadero, among others, was a fine military action. But after all, we repeat, the trumpets of this war give back a cracked sound. The whole effect was suspicious. History approves of France for making a difficulty about accepting this false triumph. It seems evident that certain Spanish officers connected with resistance yielded too easily. The idea of corruption was connected with the victory. It appears as though generals and not battles had been won, and the conquering soldier returned humiliated. A debasing war, in short, in which the Bank of France could be read in the folds of the flag. Soldiers of the War of 1808, on whom Saragossa had fallen in formidable ruin, frowned in 1823 at the easy surrender of citadels, and began to regret Palafox. It is the nature of France for her to have Rostopchin rather than Balestros in front of her. From a still more serious point of view, and one which it is also proper to assist upon here, this war, which wounded the military spirit of France, enraged the democratic spirit. It was an enterprise of enthrallment. In that campaign, the object of the French soldier, the son of democracy, was the conquest of a yoke for others, a hideous contradiction. France is made to arouse the soul of nations, not to stifle it. All the revolutions of Europe since 1792 are the French Revolution, 
liberty darts rays from France. That is a solar fact. Blind is he who will not see. It was Bonaparte who said it. The War of 1823, an outrage on the generous Spanish nation, was then, at the same time, an outrage on the French Revolution. It was France who committed this monstrous violence, by foul means, for, with the exceptions of wars of liberation, everything that armies do is by foul means. The words passive obedience indicate this. An army is a strange masterpiece of combination, whereas force results from an enormous sum of impotence. Thus is war, made by humanity against humanity, despite humanity, explained. As for the Bourbons, the War of 1823 was fatal to them. They took it for a success. They did not perceive the danger that lies in having an idea slain to order. They went astray in their innocence to such a degree that they introduced the immense enfeeblement of a crime into their establishment as an element of strength. The spirit of the ambush entered into their politics. 1830 had its germ in 1823. The Spanish campaign became in their councils an argument for force and for adventure by divine right. France, having re-established El Rey Neto in Spain, might well have re-established the absolute king at home. They fell into the alarming error of taking the obedience of the soldier for the consent of the nation. Such confidence is the ruin of thrones. It is not permitted to fall asleep, either in the shadow of a machinil tree, nor in the shadow of an enemy. Let us return to the ship Orion. During the operations of the army commanded by the Prince Generalissimo, a squadron had been cruising in the Mediterranean. We have just stated that the Orion belonged to this fleet, and that accidents of the sea had brought it into the port at Toulon. The presence of a vessel of war in a port has something about it which attracts and engages a crowd. It is because it is great, and the crowd loves what is great. A ship of the line is one of the most magnificent combinations of the genius of man with the powers of nature. A ship of the line is composed, at the same time, of the heaviest and the lightest of possible matter, for it deals at one and the same time with three forms of substance, solid, liquid, and fluid, and it must do battle with all three. It has eleven claws of iron with which to seize the granite on the bottom of the sea, and more wings and more antennae than winged insects, to catch the wind in the clouds. Its breath pours out through its hundred and twenty cannons as through enormous trumpets, and replies proudly to the thunder. The ocean seeks to lead it astray in the alarming sameness of its billows, but the vessel has its soul, its compass, which counsels it and always shows it the north. In the blackest nights its lanterns supply the place of the stars. Thus, against the wind, it had its cordage and its canvas, against the water wood, against the rocks, its iron, brass, and lead, against the shadows, its light, and against immensity, a needle. If one wishes to form an idea of all those gigantic proportions which, taken as a whole, constitute the ship of the line, one has only to enter one of the six-story covered construction stocks in the ports of Brest or Toulon. The vessels in process of construction are under a bell glass there, as it were, this colossal beam is a yard. That great column of wood which stretches on the earth as far as the eye can reach is the mainmast. Taking it from its root in the stocks to its tip in the clouds, it is sixty fathoms long, and its diameter as its base is three feet. The English mainmast rises to a height of two hundred and seventeen feet above the water line. The navy of our fathers employed cables, ours employs chains. The simple pile of chains on a ship of a hundred guns is four feet high. 20 feet in breadth and 8 feet in depth. And how much wood is required to make this ship? 3,000 cubic meters. It is a floating fortress. And moreover, let this be borne in mind, it is only a question here of the military vessel of 40 years ago, of the simple sailing vessel. Steam, then in its infancy, has since added new miracles to that prodigy which is called a war vessel. At the present time, for example, the mixed vessel with a screw is a surprising machine, propelled by 3,000 square meters of canvas and by an engine of 2,500 horsepower. Not to mention these new marvels, the ancient vessel of Christopher Columbus and of Du Roitier is one of the masterpieces of man, inexhaustible in force as is the infinite in gales. It stores up the wind in its sails, it is precise in the immense vagueness of the billows, it floats and it rains. There comes an hour, nevertheless, when the gale breaks that sixty-foot yard like a straw, when the wind bends that mast four hundred feet tall, 
when that anchor which weighs tens of thousands is twisted in the jaws of the waves like a fisherman's hook in the jaws of a pike, when those monstrous cannons utter plaintive and futile roars, which the hurricane bears forth into the void and into the night, when all that power and all that majesty are engulfed in a power and majesty which are supreme. Every time that immense force is displayed to culminate in an immense feebleness, it affords men food for thought. Hence, in the ports, curious people abound around these marvelous machines of war and of navigation, without being able to explain perfectly to themselves why. Every day, accordingly, from morning until night, the quays, sluices, and the jetties of the port of Toulon were covered with a multitude of idlers and loungers, as they say in Paris, whose business consisted in staring at the Orion. The Orion was a ship that had been ailing for a long time. In the course of its previous cruises, thick layers of barnacles had collected on its keel to such a degree as to deprive it of half its speed. It had gone into the dry dock the year before this in order to have the barnacles scraped off. Then it had put to sea again, but this cleaning had affected the bolts of the keel. In the neighborhood of the Balearic Isles, the sides had been strained and had opened, and as the plating in those days was not of sheet iron, the vessel had sprung a leak. A violent equinoctial gale had come up, which had at first staved in a grating in a porthole on the larboard side, and damaged the foretop gallant shrouds. In consequence of these injuries, the Orion had run back to Toulon. It anchored near the arsenal, it was fully equipped, and repairs were begun. The hull had received no damage on the starboard, but some of the planks had been unnailed here and there, according to custom to prevent of air entering the hold. One morning the crowd, which was gazing at it, at it was witnessed an accident. The crew was busy mending the sails. The topman, who had to take the upper corner of the main topsail on the starboard, lost his balance. He was seen to waver. The multitude thronging the arsenal quay uttered a cry. The man's head overbalanced his body. The man fell around the yard. With his hands outstretched toward the abyss, on his way he seized the foot rope, first with one hand, then with the other, and remained hanging from it. The sea lay below him at a dizzying depth. The shock of his fall had imparted to the foot rope a violent swinging motion. The man swayed back and forth at the end of that rope like a stone in a sling. It was incurring a frightful risk to go to his assistance. Not one of the sailors, all fishermen of the coast, recently levied for the service, dared to attempt it. In the meantime, the unfortunate topman was losing his strength. His anguish could not be discerned on his face, but his exhaustion was visible in every limb. His arms were contracted in horrible twitchings. Every effort which he made to reascend served but to augment the oscillations of the foot rope. He did not shout for fear of exhausting his strength. All were awaiting the minute when he should release his hold on the rope. And from instant to instant, heads were turned that his fall might not be seen. There are moments when a bit of rope, a pole, the branch of a tree, is life itself, and it's a terrible thing to see a living being detach himself from it and fall like a ripe fruit. All at once, a man was seen climbing into the ribbing, rigging with the agility of a tiger cat. This man was dressed in red. He was a convict. He wore a green cap. He was a life convict. On arriving on a level with the top, a gust of wind carried away his cap and allowed a perfectly white head to be seen. He was not a young man. A convict employed on board with a detachment from the galleys had, in fact, at the very first instant, hastened to the officer of the watch. And in the midst of the consternation and the hesitation of the crew, while all the sailors were trembling and drawing back, he had asked the officer's permission to risk his life to save the topman. At an affirmative sign from the officer, he had broken the chain riveted to his ankle with one blow of a hammer. Then he had caught up a rope and had dashed into the rigging. No one noticed, at the instant, with what ease the chain had been broken. It was only later on that the incident was recalled. In a twinkling, he was on the yard. He paused for a few seconds and appeared to be measuring it with his eye. These seconds, during which the breeze swayed the topman at the extremity of a thread, seemed centuries to those who were looking on. At last, the conv convict raised his eyes to heaven and advanced a step. The crowd drew a long breath. He was seen to run out along the yard. On arriving at the point, he fastened the rope to which he had brought to it and allowed the other end to hang down. Then he began to descend the rope, hand over hand, and then, and the anguish was indescribable, instead of one man suspended over the gulf, there were two. One would have said it was a spider coming to seize a fly, only here the spider brought life, not death. Ten thousand glances were fastened on this group. Not a cry, not a word, the same tremor contracted every brow. All mouths held their breasts, as though they feared to add the slightest puff of wind, which was swaying the two unfortunate men. In the meantime, the convict had succeeded in lowering himself to a position near the sailor. It was high time. One minute more, an exhausted and despairing man would have allowed himself to fall into the abyss. The convict had moored him securely with the cord to which he clung with one hand, while he was working with the other. At last he was seen to climb back on the yard and drag the sailor up after him. 
He held him there a moment to allow him to recover his strength, and then he grasped him in his arms and carried him, walking on the yard himself to the cap, and from there to the main top, where he left him in the hands of his comrades. At that moment, the crowd broke into applause. Old convict sergeants among them wept, and women embraced each other on the quay, and all voices were heard to cry with a sort of tender rage, Pardon for that man. He, in the meantime, had immediately begun to make his descent to rejoin his detachment. In order to reach them the more speedily, he dropped into the rigging and ran along one of the lower yards. All eyes were following him. At a certain moment, fear assailed them. Whether it was that he was fatigued or that his head turned, they thought they saw him hesitate and stagger. All at once, the crowd uttered a loud shout. The convict had fallen into the sea. The fall was perilous. The frigate Algeceres was anchored alongside the Orion, and the poor convict had fallen between the two vessels. It was to be feared that he would slip under one or the other of them. Four men flung themselves hastily into a boat. The crowd cheered them on. Anxiety again took possession of all souls. The man had not risen to the surface. He had disappeared in the sea without leaving a ripple, as though he had fallen into a cask of oil. They sounded, they dived. In vain. The search was continued until the evening. They did not even find the body. On the following day, the Toulon newspaper printed these lines. November 17th, 1823. Yesterday, a convict belonging to the detachment on board of the Orion, on his return from rendering assistance to a sailor, fell into the sea and was drowned. The body has not yet been found. It is supposed that it is entangled under the piles of the Arsenal Point. This man was committed under the number 9,430, and his name was Jean Valjean. End of Book 2, Chapter 3 This is a LibriVox recording. Chapter 1 of Box 3 of Les Miserables, Volume 2, by Victor Hugo. Translated by Isabel Florence Hapgood. Recording by Geneva. Box 3, Chapter 1. The Water Question at Montfermeil. Montfermeil is situated between Livry and the Shares, on the southern edge of that lofty tableland which separates the Ork from the Marne. At the present day, it is a tolerably large town ornamented all the years through with plaster villas, and on Sundays with beaming bourgeois. In 1823, there were at Montfermeil neither so many white houses nor so many well-satisfied citizens. It was only a village in the forest. Some pleasure houses of the last century were to be met with there, to be sure, which were recognizable by their grand air, their balconies in twisted iron, and their long windows, whose tiny panes cast all sorts of varying shades of green on the white of the closed shutters. But Montfermeil was none the less a village. Retired clothes merchants and rusticating attorneys had not discovered it as yet. It was a peaceful and charming place, which was not on the road to anywhere. Their people lived, and cheaply, that peasant rustic life which is so bounteous and so easy. Only, water was rare there, on account of the elevation of the plateau. It was necessary to fetch it from a considerable distance. The end of the village towards Gagny drew its water from the magnificent ponds which exist in the woods there. The other end, which surrounds the church and which lies in the direction of Cheers, found drinking water only at a little spring halfway down the slope, near the road to Cheers, about a quarter of an hour from Montfermeil. Thus each household found it hard work to be supplied with water. The large houses, the aristocracy, of which the Thénardier Tavin formed a part, paid half a farthing a bucket for to a man who made a business of it and who earned about eight sous a day in his enterprise of supplying Montfermeil with water. But this good man only worked until seven o'clock in the evening in summer and five in winter. And night once come and the shutters on the ground floor once closed, he who had no water to drink went to fetch it for himself or did without it. This constituted the terror of the poor creature, whom the reader has probably not forgotten, little Cossette. It will be remembered that Cosette was useful to the Thénardiers in two ways. They made the mother pay them, and they made the child serve them. So when the mother ceased to pay altogether, the reason for which we have read in the preceding chapters, the Thénardiers kept Cosette. She took the place of a servant in their house. In this capacity, she it was who ran to fetch water when it was required. So the child, who was greatly terrified at the idea of going to spring at night, took great care that water should never be lacking in the house. 
Christmas of the year 1823 was particularly brilliant at Montfermeil. The beginning of the winter had been mild. There had been neither snow nor frost up to that time. Some mountebanks from Paris had obtained permission of the mayor to erect their booths in the principal street of the village, and a band of itinerant merchants, under protection of the same tolerance, had constructed their stalls on Church Square, and even extended them into Bolanga Alley. Well, as the reader will perhaps remember, the Tenadiers' hostelry was situated. These people filled inns and the drinking shops, and communicated to that tranquil little district a noisy and joyous life. In order to play the part of faithful historian, we ought even to add that among the curiosities displayed in the square, there was a menagerie in which frightful clones, clad in rags and coming no one knew whence, exhibited to the peasants of Montfermeil in 1823 one of those horrible Brazilian vultures, such as our Royal Museum did not possess until 1845, and which have a tricolored cockade for an eye. I believe that naturalists call this bird Caracara polyborus. It belongs to the order of the Epicides and to the family of the vultures. Some good old Bonapartist soldiers who had retired to the village went to see this creature with great devotion. The mountebanks gave out that the tricolor cockade was a unique phenomenon made by God expressly for their menagerie. On Christmas Eve itself, a number of men, carters and peddlers, were seated at table, drinking and smoking around four or five candles in the public room of Tenadier's hostelry. This room resembles all drinking shop rooms, tables, pewter jugs, bottles, drinkers, smokers, but little light and great deal of noise. The date of the year 1823 was indicated, nevertheless, by two objects which were then fashionable in the bourgeois class, to wit, a kaleidoscope and a lamp of red tin. The female Tinadia was attending to the supper, which was roasting in front of a clear fire. Her husband was drinking with his customers and talking politics. Besides political conversations, which had for their principal subjects the Spanish War and Monsieur Le Doc de Angoulême, strictly local parentheses like the following were audible amid the uproar. About Nantes and Suresne, the vines had flourished greatly. When ten pieces were recalled on, there had been twelve. They have yielded a great deal of juice under the press, but the grapes cannot be ripe. In those parts, the grapes should not be ripe. The wine turns oily as soon as spring comes. Then it is very thin wine. There are wines poorer even than this. The grapes must be gathered while green, etc. Or a miller would call out, Are we responsible for what is in the sacks? We find in them a quantity of small seed which we cannot sift out, and which we are obliged to send through the millstones. There are tails, fennel, vetches, hemp seeds, foxtail, and a host of other weeds, not to mention pebbles, which are bound in certain wheat, especially in Breton wheat. I am not fond of grinding Breton wheat any more than long soils like to saw beams with nails in them. You can judge of the bad dust that makes in grinding. And then people complain about flour. They are in the round, the flour is not for of ours. In a space between two windows, a mower, who was seated at table with a landed proprietor, who was fixing a price for some meadow work to be performed in the spring, was saying, it is no harm to have the grass wet. It cuts better. Do is a good thing, sir. It makes no difference with the grass. The grass is very young and very hard to cut steer. It's terribly tender. It yields before the iron, etc. Cosette was in her usual place, seated on the crossbar of the kitchen table beyond the chimney. She was in rags. Her bare feet were thrust into wooden shoes, and by the firelight she was engaged in knitting woolen stockings destined for the young Tenadiers. A very young kitten was playing about among the chairs. Laughter and chatter were audible in the adjoining room from two fresh children's voices. It was Abonina and Azelma. In the chimney corner, a cat and nine tails was hanging on a nail. At intervals, the cry of a very young child which was somewhere in the house, ran through the noise of the dram shop. It was a little boy who had been born to the Tenadiers during one of the preceding winters. She did not know why, she said, the result of the cold, and who was a little more than three years old. The mother had nursed him, but she did not love him. When the persistent clamor of the bread became too annoying, 
Your son is calling," Tenadier would say. "Do go and see what he wants." But the mother would reply, "He bothers me," and the neglected child continued to shriek in the dark. End of Box Three, Chapter One: The Water Question at Montfermeil.